you ever go down Trinidad? Hello again, everyone. Today we're going to be covering a uniform piece that has caused a great deal of confusion throughout the reenactor community. HBTs were known as the Army's Utility Uniform. These uniforms were made out of cotton herringbone twill, notable for their unique pattern design. These uniforms were a staple of the Pacific Theater of Operations. However, that'll be a topic for another day. Instead, we're going to talk about their use in the Mediterranean and European theaters of operation. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll start on the discussion of their history and development throughout the war. The Army began production on the HBT uniform in 1941 with the intention of replacing the already existing denim work fatigues. These uniforms were intended to be worn over top of your issued wool uniform in order to keep them clean while you did your work. Their initial design featured a top with waist adjusters along the side, a defined shirt cuff, and two pleated breast pockets. The trousers were a fairly simple and standard design, being similar to the ones used on wool and khaki trousers at the time, as well as a wide-brimmed hat that covered the head that was known as the Daisy May cap. This set is known today as the first pattern HBT set, being the very beginning of what would become the future of the U.S. Army fatigues. As the war pressed on, the military realized that budget cuts needed to be made in order to keep up with demand. One of the targets for this cut was the HBTs. In 1942, the Army redesigned their work fatigues, removing pretty much anything that would be deemed cosmetic in favor of practicality. The shirts got rid of the waist adjusters and cuff trim in favor of a much simpler design. The pleated pockets were swapped out in favor of two large cargo pockets instead, which helped greatly with storage. The trousers as well got rid of the traditional trouser pockets in favor of two big cargo pockets on either side of your waist. The Daisy May was not spared from this redesign either, being traded out for a simple mechanic style cap. This uniform, while not as cosmetically pleasing, proved to be much more versatile with its superior storage capacity compared to its predecessor. These fatigues are known among the reenacting world as the second pattern HBT uniform. These fatigue uniforms were typically dyed at the time in a shading that was designated as OD8, or what we often call today, sage green. By late 1943 into 1944, the Army was beginning to make changes in its equipment shading. The Army started manufacturing all of their equipment in the shade OD7, a darker shade compared to what had been seen for most of the war prior to this. The HBT uniforms were not spared from this shade change, and by the Normandy invasion, OD7 HBTs were becoming a fairly common uniform piece to see. Another major change was made to the two-piece uniform in April of 1944, that being the placement of the trousers cargo pockets. For the majority of the second pattern's existence during the war, the trouser pockets were high up on the waist, but in April of 1944, they dropped the pockets roughly four inches to make them more easily accessible when wearing. These trousers, however, would not see much use until later in the war. Working for the Yankee dollar. Some second pattern uniforms could also be seen with a pleat on the pocket. There are many misconceptions about this pleated version of the second pattern, with some even coining it as a third pattern HBT model some believing this to be a late war manufacture. This couldn't be further from the truth. The most likely answer behind these pleated patterns is simply a design choice made by the manufacturers. There are HBT uniforms that can be found dating to early 1943 that feature these pleated pockets and can coincide in manufacturing with the straight pocket HBTs. In addition to these two-piece uniforms, there were also coveralls. Coveralls are a topic that shall be saved for their own video as they deserve to be discussed for those looking into unique rear echelon roles. There were also other unique fatigues issued, such as camouflage HBTs. Camouflage patterns were extremely experimental with the U.S. Army during the war, with this pattern seeing a lot more use among the United States Marines. Only a small handful of Army units actually received these camouflage uniforms, most notably among those the 2nd Armored Division in 1944. These uniforms would not live a very long life. There were a number of reasons the Army never moved forward with these uniforms. Many people believe that they were taken out as a result of friendly fire incidences caused by them being mistaken for German camouflage. This, however, is not entirely true. 
While these incidences certainly did happen, there were a great deal more friendly fire incidences recorded with the use of standard HPT uniforms as opposed to the camouflage ones. What it really ends up coming down to is the cost. These uniforms were very expensive to make. They took much more time and money compared to other uniforms. In addition, the uniform's camouflage effectiveness was questionable. In field testing, these uniforms were found to actually make the soldier stand out more compared to the standard OD shading, especially when moving. This would result in camouflage being taken out of circulation relatively quickly. However, they would still see use in stateside training. With the European theater in particular, the use and distribution of HBTs to troops can be rather confusing. This has often sparked heated debates within the reenactor community on their use. Today, we'd like to give you some sort of idea as to their use and distribution so you can be aware when these uniforms are appropriate for your impressions. For the vast majority of combat infantry impressions in the ETO, the primary uniform seen was the wool uniforms. HBTs were commonly seen being issued to vehicle operators, mechanics, cooks, field surgeons, among the large number of other roles in the rear echelon. However, there are exceptions to that rule. It all depends on the time, battle, and division you are portraying. For example, there are certain divisions that did receive HBT uniforms on D-Day for those landing in the first waves that were coated in a chemical known as CC2, which was supposed to help against gas attacks. There are also a handful of divisions, such as the 4th Infantry Division, who use them consistently throughout their time overseas. Context is always important when doing an impression, so be sure to do extensive research on the division and time frame you wish to portray. In terms of purchasing HPT uniforms, the pickings are surprisingly slim. The only company at the moment currently making first pattern HPTs is Soldier of Fortune, with at the front World War II impressions having been out of stock for some time. The second patterns get tricky. While many companies make them, most of them make the pockets very low, fitting better in the realm of late war impressions. However, such sites as at the front and World War II impressions make these uniforms with the high pocket placement making them more acceptable for earlier impressions. They also offer camo HBTs. As of recording, unfortunately, both of these sites are out of stock of their light shade HBTs. If you're in a pinch and need them for an upcoming event, a little site called Hiki Shop currently offers them with the proper pocket placement. However, I'd recommend putting in your order now as they usually take about three weeks to arrive. And it, of course, goes without saying that originals crop up on eBay rather frequently. We hope this video can put to rest the argument on their use in the war. HBTs were a huge stepping stone for the United States military, with their concepts still being used in the modern day. Special thank yous go to the Smiley GI for providing us with reference for CC2 impregnation. Be sure to check out his website, which has helpful articles and more for reenacting the USGI. A link will be provided in the description. With that being said, we hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to stay tuned for future episodes. And remember... We're in the army now, they drafted us and how. We're up with the sun to shoulder a gun. We're in the army now, we're in the army now. We're eating army chow. The menu goes far, it ain't caviar. We're in the army now, they march us here and there. Our feet go everywhere. They're twisted and turned, they're blistered and burned. We're in the army now.